And our next speaker is a very impressive personality, and uh, she looks on a very exciting career path as well. Uh, born in China and based in Hong Kong, Jennifer Sue Scott has a background in applied mathematics, computer science, and she also has a master in finance. She serves the World Economic Forum since 2014 and has been reappointed as a council member in Inaugural Council of the Future of Blockchain in 2016. And just um, in the last edition, this uh, January, she was discussing um, crypto assets um, and debating against uh, the Nobel Prize winner Professor Robert Schiller and uh, the Swedish Central Bank Deputy Governor Cecilia Skingsley which has been also televised uh, in China. Um, besides this role of being an ambassador for um, cryptocurrencies, she's also running her own fund, and uh, she's the founding partner of Radiant Partners, where she helps family offices to make uh, double bottom line um, investments directly into AI and also blockchain startups. And most importantly, she told me on the phone that uh, she is an advisor to HBO Silicon Valley in the latest edition, which is amazing. I would love to learn more about that. That must have been great fun. I'm a big fan of the series. So today she's going to put a focus on the historical events that uh, led us to um, now to today and the development of the blockchain today. And uh, she explains us why she thinks now is the right time for the blockchain uh, and the sustainable energy sector. With that, please join me in welcoming Jennifer Sue Scott. Thank you, Erwin. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. It's um, my great pleasure to come to Berlin. It's my first time in Berlin and Germany. So um, if you have any tips where to go, please tell me. Um, my background, thank you all, is a great introduction. Um, I study mathematics, and uh, I love history and philosophy. And because I do a lot of work in AI, I find there's no better place to explain the latest technology where the society will be led to by looking back to history and uh, going back to the most fundamental questions often being discussed by philosophers and historians for thousands of years. Because I come from China. So let's start from China. This is a very famous painting um, done in the, uh, around the 11th century in China during Song Dynasty. Um, it's uh, a painting called Qingming Shang He Tu. The English translation is um, um, a, you know, Day by the River during the Qingming Festival. The significance of this painting basically describes what happens in Song Dynasty, the prosperity, the commerce, and the trade. Song Dynasty was also very interesting for people who are interested in blockchain because Song Dynasty was the first um, uh, you know, government in the world issued paper money called Jiaozi. So Jiaozi was uh, issued by the uh, Song Dynasty from a bank in Sichuan where I was born and brought up. And Jiaozi didn't have any, in, any intrinsic value, but it was, was used based on um, a set kind of conversion rate with silk, gold, and silver. From Song Ming, uh, from Tang Song Ming Dynasty, and exception with the Yuan Dynasty, those four dynasties really was leading time for China's economy. China had the largest GDP in the world. China also was uh, the major exporter for technology. So when we were using porcelains, uh, the West was still using clay pot. When we were using silk, China, uh, the West is still using uh, cotton or linen. And um, printing, commerce, uh, trade, China was uh, a few, you know, in, in some aspects, it's a few hundred years ahead compared to the rest. This is the uh, earlier 20th century in America. What you are seeing is the power line. Power line was brought to every family was because of the invention of light bulb. And light bulb was a simple tool to illum for illumination, but that brought power line to every household and that changed how we live. So because we have power line, we have washing machine and household, and we have refrigerator, which changed how our retail um, is organized. Uh, changed the, you know, power line get brought into factory, changed how manufacturing is organized. So people work in different shifts. 
power line also changed the shape of our city. Because of the electricity, our buildings became taller. And this is another historical moment we're going back through. From late 19th century to early uh, 20th century, um, we experienced a major oil boom. Why we experienced the oil boom? And the beginning, oil was basically used as uh, um, you know, um, um, material for us to, for, for illumination. But by the time, as you can see from the California, um, this uh, um, oil field, we, within 20, 30 years in, in the entire you know, America experience, the major boom was because of this. This is the actual picture of the Easter parade in 1900 on the Fifth Avenue in New York. This is 10 years later. So in, on the 19th, 1900, um, on the picture on your left, um, you can see on the streets is pretty, pretty much all horse carts. And on the right, we have cars. So because of the cars, it changed how we build our buildings, how we plan our cities, and also it changed the geopolitics because oil was limited resources. Who can recognize what's this chart? This is now the more recent historical moment we're going through. Can anyone recognize this chart? This is the dot-com bubble. So dot-com bubble and the, its peak was two th the valuation of the entire tech industry was about 2.6 uh, 2 trillion. It was massive, massive bubble. Those are the companies who um, went to IPO just because they had the website, nothing else. And um, we probably don't remember most of them because all of them have gone bust. So the reason I'm taking those historical moments is because history often is a very reliable resource for us to compare what's happening before. Things were not, history almost you know, never really repeat um, in the exact literal way, but history is a very reliable resource for us to compare what's happening now. So the availability of electricity, in my view, it's very similar to availability of AI. AI is, as important as electricity in the 20th century. It will empower every single industry. We should see AI as utility in instead of an edge. Oil industry empowered the most powerful, most important engine in the 19th century, 20th century, and it's similar to big data that's empowering the most important engine in 21st century. Now, dot-com bubble, is very similar to crypto bubble right now. Not in the way in terms of how, in terms, especially in terms of the size, in terms of the nature of the companies, but in terms of um, the historical um, you know, milestone, when the dot-com bubble bursted, it was the beginning of the true transportation, uh, transformation of um, internet to our entire economy. When crypto bubble burst, I think it's not the end, like a lot of people predicted. I think it's the beginning of um, how we reorganize our economy. So as you can see, those historical moments, what we learn from those historical moments is that when there's a new tool, a new technology bring to our society, it's not merely just replace what's happening or what, how people doing certain things at that time but it reorganized our physical space and it reorganized how, reshape how we conduct our human activity. There's another two fundamental shift compared to the last industrial revolution compared to this one. The first one is the, from the last, last industrial revolution was about allocation of uh, resource of scarcity, land, labor, and capital. In this industrial revolution we're going through, we still have some of the resources are scarce, resources are scarce right? But we also allocate resources of um, abundance. So renewable energy is resources of abundance. Big data is resources of abundance. So if you think about what does productivity mean is input versus output. So if you're still using the old um, you know, resources and use old 
um, oil, um, you know, to to fuel your your business and you power your um, you know your your factories. Um, you literally are giving up an enormous economic incentive to become more efficient and using much lower input to achieve same, if not greater, output. Now, this is a very important economic argument and historical argument of why we should use renewable energy. Now, another very interesting sh paradigm shift from the last industrial revolution to this one is we shift from centralization to still partially centralization, but it's not exclusively. We will have coexistence between centralization and decentralization. For example, with 3D printing, we will be able to print and manufacture products locally, even at your home. With blockchain, we'll uh, uh, make people, you know, we'll make it possible for us to uh, collaborate in a very large scale based on coding, not based on the centralized trust institution. With micro-renewable grid, we'll empower people removed from the general utility suppliers, but have your micro-economy. And zero marginal cost. Using YouTube, Twitter, you will be able to reach millions of people without any incremental cost. Now, a thousand years shifting from the first painting I shared with you, what's happening in China today. In China today, we have about 800 million uh, smartphone users. That's more than the entire European population. That's almost three times as the entire US population. It's not only just the sheer number of the smartphone users we have in China, but how we use the smartphone. QR code is everywhere in China. If you think Facebook knows too much about our life, you haven't, you haven't met Tencent yet. This is um, how vegetable vendors selling uh, vegetable in China. You notice she's using a QR code. You can pay with your phone. This is how people in China use um, uh, taxi. If you don't have, um, if you use cash or if you don't have a WeChat wallet set up in China, it's actually quite challenging to get a car in China. This is how we go to gym. Uh, this cargo, com you know, cargo ship com converted to the gym has no staff, no membership. You just use your WeChat to log in, to open the door, and when you finish, you just oh, close the door, you scan again. It will automatically charge into your WeChat wallet. Again, no membership, no appointment, um, no staff. This is how kids in China use vending machine. They use the phone to scan. And last but not least, this is how beggars in China asking for money. So what we see in China today is a complete shift from, um, you know, one of the probably most backwards uh, country in terms of financial infrastructure to most, most advanced. Um, in 2016, 2000, unfortunately, 2017 figure is not yet out yet. 2016, online payment in China was about 8.6 trillion US dollars, and it's growing on four times year on year. US number was about 112 billion, growing on 39% year on year. So there is no comparison. In terms of cars, in last panel we talk about, in China, if you park your car in the very large shopping mall, often we have to remember which, which floor, you know, where we park the car. But in China, you scan, in, every, in front of every car park, you can scan a QR code, and that QR code will become a navigation tool to guide you back to where you park your car. But also, it's a payment system. But furthermore, because you have that data, so in China, there are startups using this data to enable you, if I have a monthly car park, and I don't use every day, I can sublet my car park. And people can have peer-to-peer -peer payments through WeChat. And coming back to the cars, so um, Freeman Shen uh, is my classmate. I'm very fortunate and, and, um, you know, to have a close friend in my life. He's, um, uh, he was the CEO of, Vo he was CEO of um, Geely, so Geely Motor in China. And uh, under his leadership, Geely overtook um, Volvo. And uh, three years ago, he left Geely and started his smart car company. I was told this is a German name, uh, Weltmister. So he called WM Motors. Um, means we are champions, something like that. 
uh, <laughs> world champion. So earlier this month, his, um, uh, his world champion car um, started into uh, production. And uh, the production line is completely automated. And uh, the SUV will be available um, end of this month. And um, it's completely connected smart car. It's con completely electronic car. And um, uh, the retail price is 40,000 US dollar. I think one of the panels was working for BMW, but um, I don't know how they see this kind of uh, mass productions happen in China. But what's happening in China furthermore is not only approaching in terms of you know, producing a very avail uh, affordable uh, smart cars, electronic cars, we're also looking into how we, you know, how we reinvent the roads. So this is an actual video of um, a section of highway in China, in Jinan, in East China. And uh, this is, um, entire road is paved with a uh, solar panel. And the tough solar panel, um, not only just, this is the actual picture of the solar panel um, on the road. So it can charge the cars, um, it also has a sensor to detect the weather, detect the traffic, and right now the production cost is about 1,100 per square meter. It's very, very high, but the, of course the price will come down when we achieve scale, uh, economic scale. So what we are looking at is not just putting a solar farm somewhere or a wind farm, that's um, our approach on um, you know, renewable energy. In China, apart from what I was talking about, the productivity, input versus output, there is a political pressure as well. Um, social scalability is uh, the most paramount measure for the government, and pollution has become such a social problem. So there is a, a great political mandate to really make our entire country uh, renewable as well. So in terms of the renewable, um, Blockchain is at the very, I, I, I think, you know, we're at a very historical moment right now um, using blockchain into renewable. You know, with the historical moment I shared, you know, we need to know why we want to, why we want to use renewable, but we also should know, you know, why and how this moment is the moment. In terms of the financing um, and in terms of utility, blockchain is playing very important roles um, in, in renewable space. It decentralized, so for operators, for example, operators in China, when they want to access to the right capital quickly, uh, before they have to go through very specialized PE funds, and the PE funds will invest by, you know, by another PE fund. So using blockchain can decentralize this approach and completely take away all the uh, intermediaries. And also democratize participation. Um, using smart contract, you can autom automate fundraising process. So for people who invest in 5,000 US dollars to 50 million, the process is roughly the same. Also, um, this kind of automation um, will um, extend it to you know, automate the yield payment as well using smart contract. Uh, once you tokenize a fund, so your return can be paid directly through a smart contract, um, through, through token, into, you know, through your investment. And we are making a lot of bilateral investment into multilateral investment. And uh, most importantly, also a lot of traditionally very illiquid investment now through tokenization can make them liquid. So all of this are positive to make the investment much, much more attractive. And as utility, obviously, uh, blockchains are used for peer-to-peer -peer exchange, microgrids, and uh, micro-incentives. So with the technology available right now, and uh, with the historical moments we have just um, very briefly went through, I want to just put everything into perspective. I think today we live in our life, you know, we think we're very entitled to everything this planet. We are um, expanding, we're growing, we're demanding for more. But if we want to look at the history, there's no grander history than the history of the Earth. So if we shrink the history of the Earth into one year, human being roughly showed up at the 11 p.m. on 31st of December. 
So we're really recent in this, in this world. And as we are destroying and uh, expanding and um, unlimited, you know, with uh, our greed and our vanity, and, and um, uh, I think we need to remember that the planet doesn't really need us. And if we completely destroy our environment, that, um, you know, one day the, without human, the planet actually will do better without, without us. So on that, I think we look back the history, but the best way to predict what's happened gonna be uh, in future is to work together and build a more sustainable future. Thank you. Wow, Jennifer, that was really amazing. Um, <laughs> Thank you. you are going to discuss uh, blockchain later on on the yes. panel a bit uh, further and also its impact on the renewable sector. Uh, but one question I would want to ask you, you showed us all those images of the people playing, uh, paying with WeChat in mm -hmm. China. How would you say is the blockchain going to affect that? Um, so China is a very interesting, that's a very good question. One of the reasons, China's adoption in terms of blockchain as payment is actually very slow because we've already have WeChat, right? Um, and um, there isn't a really very strong need for Chinese people to feel I have to be decentralized. So I think um, also Chinese government is now banned, um, you know, the position for Chinese government is uh, cryptocurrency is bad. Uh, blockchain is good. You're not allowed to do any cryptocurrency, but you can use blockchain. So I think the you know the the impact of WeChat uh, payment or Alipay is going to be very slow in terms of payment, but as a blockchain to enable um, you know renewable energy, enable um, you know supply chain, etc., will happen really really fast. As you also um, help family offices make direct investment into blockchain and AI startups, always uh, with double line impact, um, uh, double bottom line impact, uh, uh, what are some of the interesting business models you saw in the last couple well, of Well, one of the, um, if you're interested, I'm, I'm taking, I'm quite interested, especially now with Facebook and uh, Cambridge uh, Analytica uh, saga. I, I, I take great interest in um, data ownership. So I just wrote an um, op-ed in quads, qz.com, if you're interested to read, uh, in terms of um, how to, um, you know, using pricing, giving pricing power to individual in order to manage our privacy, data privacy. And there are quite a few companies right now, including one of them based in Berlin, I'm going to visit them tonight, very excited, um, is to be using blockchain to build a more decentralized approach in terms of um, how to manage, trade, exchange, even sell your personal data. Um, I think, um, you know, the big tech company now is going through an inflection point in terms of harvesting data. And uh, with the blockchain, many people will start to realize that, you know, to own your personal data will be as important as owning your land in 19th century. So I think this movement is just started to happen. And uh, that's the space I probably will spend a lot of time on. Great. Thank you very much, Jennifer. Thank you. See you later on the panel. Thank you. Thank you.